recorded live at the 2022 NACTA convention in Las Vegas. This is From the Chair. Here is your host, Mike Hamilton. Welcome to today's episode of From the Chair. I'm your host, Mike Hamilton. We are recording live at NACTA 2022 in Las Vegas with several athletic directors over the next few days. And so now over the next several weeks, you'll see some of these broadcasts. We hope you enjoy this time together. It's great to be together in person. And so today, my guest is Dave Hickey from the University of Arizona. Dave, thanks for joining us. Well, thanks, Mike. I really appreciate you having me and uh, opportunity to see each other, be with each other, as you say, and uh, spend a little time. It's good. It is absolutely amazing, really. First yeah. time in three years we're able to be together for NACTA. And I know it's been coming, right? Fans and back in stands and all those kind of things. But there's nothing like actually sitting with someone face to face. Yeah, that being in the presence of each other and being in the presence of other people, uh, it's really it's nice to be back to that. And uh, always good to be with colleagues and friends and, uh, you know, watch this industry continue to grow and uh, have the opportunity to build on itself and kind of maybe transform itself as we go forward. No doubt. Well, this is a particular time where we need that. A lot, yep. of, a lot, of, a lot of things happening in today's world, right? Sure so is. we'll talk about a little bit of that in a minute. Um, I, you know, I wanted to come off the top. I, I'm going to talk about career in a minute. But the first thing I want to talk about, you know, Arizona basketball is back. Not that it ever went away, <laughs> right? But, That's right. But certainly uh, you made some noise here this, this season with the hire of Tommy and, and the, the productivity of your team. And um, you know, look, you, you represent an iconic brand in the basketball landscape, uh, back to Coach Olson and, and, and even beyond. And I know that that's a serious hire when you look to how you're going to replace a coach in basketball. And I find it interesting, you know, you, you, uh, you hired an assistant coach, albeit one who's had great success and been around for a long time. Tell me a little bit about that search process and how you landed on Tommy and then what you've seen in terms of the kind of coach he is in, in, in for your program. Yeah, well, uh, first, yeah, it's uh, it's it's great to have our program, you know, headed in such a positive direction and under the leadership of, of Tommy. Um, you know, it is, as you said, it's an iconic brand. It is it is a, you know, a blue blood. It's a gold star program. However you want to label it, uh, basketball is really important uh, to the university, to our community, to our alumni base. Um, so w when you do get to those moments where you decide to make a change in leadership, um, those are key, you know, pivotal moments. And you want to you want to make sure you have the right person. Uh, but, you know, as with any search, it's really about trying to step back and identifying, hey, what do we really need? Where is the program? What are some of the things we, you know, we want to change or, or move in a different direction? Uh, what are the things that we need the right fit of a person to continue to carry on? Um, how does our community feel about, and, you know, the head coach, what they want out of a head coach? All of those things are critically important. So I think it's important. It's, it, it's really key at the beginning to step back a little bit and really examine that. Then you start to go forward, you know, looking at a lot of different people. Obviously, you're going to spread that um, wide and far. I think that the, the position deserves that. The brand deserves that you know, look and talk to a lot of people that are interested in the job that can help you along the way identify candidates that can give feedback I mean you it's 24 7 as you as you yeah. know like it's 24 7 and there's no shortage of information either right. of, of what you should or shouldn't do from people um, but you know we we quickly settled in on uh, Tommy as being a really intriguing candidate in this job and you know he didn't what every time we kept coming back hey if we were to hire an assistant coach where would we go you know, Tommy's name just kept coming up. And uh, I don't think it was as much about, can you do this without hiring a sitting head coach? Um, you know, that way we need to have the right person that can come in and do it. And, right. you know, Tommy had been at, at Gonzaga for a long, long time, uh, really been a key part of, of the, that program's growth and been with Mark, Coach Few, for a long time. So really understood what was going on and was a key player in that. So that got us to heading in the direction of Tommy. And he's done a wonderful job and, uh, um, it's uh, it's been, you know, it was it was a miraculous first year you know, to win a conference championship, to to uh, win your tournament championship in the conference, and then to be a number one seed. Um, boy, I, our people are excited. Basketball is definitely back. There's in no doubt. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. You know, and I know when you're in the search process, you're you're looking at all things, right? And but a lot of it at the end of the day is speculative, right? You're you're kind of taking a flyer and saying this is the person for our, our program. So observations from now being in it, you know. Mm -hmm. You, you know, I remember thinking about a couple of basketball coaches I was involved with where you see, okay, this guy is really good out of timeouts. He calls great sets. This guy's an unbelievable recruiter. This guy's so phenomenal in the community. What stands out? On Tommy, um, uh, really good relationships with players, um, his staff, the way he deals with people. I think it was one of the things that I was so impressed with when I first met him was this is a genuine good person you want to be around. 
you know, and it, he really draws you in. Um, and like I said, very genuine in his, in his approach. And I think that has helped build the, the entire framework of the program is those relationships. He is a relationship coach. Now, I, I, hey, all of those things you said are really important. You know, how do you X and O it? How, what's your recruiting pipelines? How do you recruit? How do you go about that? Um, how are you going to interact with your boosters, with your fan base? Be connected, as I mentioned, in the community, which is really important in Tucson. Um, in Tucson, and our alums all want to kind of feel like, hey, they, they, they can grab onto the coattails of that coach, and they, they're with them the whole way. They want to know their head coach. They want to they want to be able to see him and feel him out in the community. So that's an important piece. And I, I, I really think Tommy combines all of that, but he starts with his genuine uh, relationship building with everybody he connects with, players, uh, coaches, our staff, and certainly our alums and supporters. That's been really impressive. Yeah, so you, as you know, basketball, uh, you, I wouldn't call your situation a rebuilding situation, but if you're in basketball, you can make a, a change pretty quickly in terms of the presence of your program with a couple guys. Mm -hmm. Football's a little, little bit different from that. It's a slower build a lot of times, right? And so Jed Fish is still, I'll, I'll say he's still relatively new, right? And uh, I know Jed, as you know, that I do, and, yep. and I, I see him as a high energy guy. Um, Talk a little bit about the progress of, first of all, who is Jed, for those who don't know Jed, but then also where you see football at this point. Yeah, sure. Jed Fish, uh, our new head coach, really been in it now a little over a year. Um, but Jed was a longtime assistant, both at the college level and the NFL level, um, on the offensive side of the ball primarily, uh, really creative on the offensive side, but has worked with some phenomenal coaches. His career starts at the University of Florida with Steve Spurrier. Um, he comes to us from Bill Belichick and the New England Patriots. And everything in between kind of has that same feel to it. Had been on campus at, uh, at Minnesota, uh, Miami, uh, Michigan, UCLA. So has a, you know, a college background, but also has been at a number of NFL spots um, where he took little things from there. And a, in, a guy who just absorbed so much. And so Jed comes in, really high energy, um, a hybrid model, I call it. We're not an NFL style model program. Um, I think, but although we've moved from being a traditional college program, you know, we've really gone to the hybrid where we have a, you know, player personnel division, we have a recruiting division, we have a football operations division, um, an abundance of more staff, but really focused on running our football operation in a little bit different way, um, a more measured way. Um, you know, more analytical manner, uh, all of those things we've incorporated, and Jed brings that. He's a big thinker. Um, he is a 24-7. He, uh, and, and I, I guess I go back, um, we, we hired six new head coaches in the last year. We've had, we wow. have six new head coaches. Um, I wouldn't recommend that for anybody, yep. but, uh, but again, all of them have a passion to recruit, and I think that's so important, your ability to go out and just relentless be able to recruit and have a, a real a system to do that, and, and Jed certainly has done that. Um, our program, we, we made the decision with Jed, um, with our president, hey, we're going to strip the entire football program down, right down to the studs, and rebuild it, and have the patience, um, have the drive and desire to build it the right way, and we're gonna all have to be on board with that and, and see you know, that it knows that that's a little bit slower. It's kind of like that old house that you remodel. Yep. You, know, you get a little bit done and you're really happy with that, but you've got more to go until you finally get there. And I, that's how we've looked at it. And I think we continue to get a lot closer. Really good recruiting and, and uh, the, our best years are ahead of us. I was proud of our football program last year and, and Jed and the staff's ability to motivate. I, I, you know, we only had one win. And that's hard to go through. You know, we, 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 are, we are measured every day yeah. on those wins and losses. Um, I was so proud of how our players continued to compete the entire year. And that, I think they set the tone for this new football program at Arizona, a new way to do things. Look forward to a lot of success there. Let's talk about facilities for a second. We were talking offline here. You've, you've done $80 million in facility work over the last few years. I know you've got a big project coming in golf. I want you to talk about. Um, first, I want to ask about McHale just for a minute. <laughs> sure. Given how important basketball is to your success and the tradition and the history there, how do you make sure that a facility – uh, that's been around for a while, but is a really special place. How do you stay on top of it in terms of making that facility one that continues to thrive for the long haul? I think this, Dan, 1973, McHale Center, uh, iconic building in college basketball, um, some um, unbelievable uh, memories there and, and moments uh, right up through last season. But we have to continue to look at a building that was built, again, back in the 70s on how we serve our fans, how, how things have changed, the experience has changed. Um, we've done a lot of, improved a lot of club space, kind of cleared some things out, looked for more interactive ways for our fans to, to be connected inside the building. Um, you know, we've improved our student 
uh, athlete services there inside the building as well. That's a big part of your facilities yep. is how you serve your student athletes, how that experience for them can be um, excellent like we all want it to be, uh, whether that's locker rooms, training facilities, our strength and conditioning centers, our academics, you know, those are, and, and McHale is an interesting building. Uh, the athletic department primarily, like many of our places, every single staff member used to be in that building. Our football team used to dress in that building and walk wow. across the street yeah. to the football yeah. stadium. You know, so this thing has grown and, and obviously become more specialized and, and we need to utilize those spaces in a different way. And, and also I think uh, we've tried to find ways to upgrade the experience for our fans, premium spaces, uh, quite frankly, opportunities to increase revenues for our, you know, our program. Um, and, and so we're in the midst of that. And uh, prior to my arrival, there was a, 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 an outstanding about $40 million renovation to the facility. So that really upgraded it. We probably have another, you know, 60 million that we could do, but we, we chip away is what we do. We kind of take a few little things and try to see what we can accomplish. Uh, and that I think has been predicated by what we've gone through the last few years. You know, the opportunity going through the pandemic, the uncertainties, all of us have challenges with our resources. How do we do this in smaller buckets now? Uh, but as we come out of that, we'll be looking at some, some pretty exciting things in McHale long term. So you're in a great golfing community and your golf programs have had success for a long time. Talk to me a little bit about what's coming there. Well, we're excited to, uh, we've just announced a, um, a nearly $15 million uh, golf facility that'll include clubhouse, locker room facilities, coaches' offices, um, brand new practice facility, short game facility, uh, high tech facility, uh, you know, a new, new driving range uh, along, along with our local country club. The Tucson Country Club. We've partnered to build that together, and we've we've uh, we've raised the money to put it. And we're starting to put a, a final uh, run on the on the uh, the plans, and we we hope within the next uh, very soon we'll be putting a shovel in the ground. So that will house our golf programs. It's interesting. Uh, the weather's fabulous. We have tremendous golf in in the southwest, and certainly in Tucson. Great history of golfers that have gone through on both the men's and women's side. National championships, um, but our teams have never had. A central home. They've never really had a place to call their own. Uh, as I like to say, they've kind of worked out of the trunks of their car and yeah. gone to these great golf courses and uh, give them tons of credit and our coaches for getting there. But this will be a tremendous home for them. We're really proud of that um, and we'll help our golf programs going forward. We want to be in it with all of our programs to uh, to contend and compete for, for championships, both at the conference level, but at the national level. That's very important in Tucson and at the University of Arizona and our golf programs will continue to do that. It's a great update. So let's pivot back to career for just a second. You and I were yeah. talking, you know, you had a long tenure at Oregon, yeah. a long tenure as athletic director at, at Central Michigan. You've now been at Arizona for five years. Um, it would probably not be an exaggeration to say those are outlier type <laughs> scenarios, right? Yeah. I remember when I, I, was at, I was at Tennessee for 19 years and a lot of people are amazed by that. That 19 years at one place? Yeah. You know, nobody does that anymore. Yeah. So, uh, so obviously you're a stable guy, but you've also worked around people who uh, mm -hmm. obviously you've, you've seen eye to eye on how to, mm -hmm. how to manage your business. Um, curious as to what stands out when you start thinking about why you've been at places for a long time. That's a great question. Um, um, you know, my, my dad was, uh, was a dentist, uh, pretty straightforward. We kind of, he kind of went to work at eight and, you know, by 5.45, we were all at the table having dinner every day. And, uh, you know, it was, it was a nice cycle. There was a nice stable environment. So maybe that's a little bit of who I am in the, in the back of my mind. But, uh, you know, this, this industry is, is so, uh, um, you know, fast moving and people have to move around to move up in their careers. And I was really fortunate. My first job, I was at Michigan State for a short period of time, fortunate to get started there. But my really first job was to move to, to the West Coast and go to work for the University of Oregon. Um, and, uh, and then I, I Who really. Who was the AD then? Bill know. Byrne. Bill Byrne. You know, and, okay. and there's a great. I worked there through four different athletic directors, uh, three different presidents, um, a lot of transition at, at Oregon, and somehow I continued to to stay there and and find my my niches to to continue. And so it really was almost like moving. Though I I always say this is that well all of those ADs brought different things to the table. There were different focuses, different visions, different initiatives, and so it was a, a very vibrant learning experience. We did not have the same athletic director and president for 19, for the 18 and a half years yeah. that I was there, um, and so it was a really vibrant place to to learn and grow. And the story there, you know, is really. Oregon was a much different place 
in 1988 when I when I arrived to where it is obviously today and and to be part of that ride was was again a, a great career learning opportunity for me I, I don't know if I could have gotten those kind of experiences in that manner if I bounced around um, which again no discredit to anyone that it right. just offered me the perfect opportunity to do that and so um, to learn from those different athletes who Bill Byrne being the first Rich Brooks, our head football coach, became the athletic director. Now, that was a, a different experience for a young professional to see, to see the football coach come in and say, I'm going to be the athletic director. We had a vice president then. When Rich left, we had a vice president that came across campus to be um, our, our athletic director for a few years. Um, and then Bill Moose, who finished off my career there. Um, and, uh, and Bill and I worked for a long time together. So, again, learning from different ways, right. different, you know, different Points, totally different jumps. methodologies, I'm sure. Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And so that, that's offered me the, the chance, it offered me the chance to stay there for a long time, really feel comfortable about it. Um, I, we have three children now who are grown, but I had three children at that time, and a terrific opportunity to go back to my home state, my wife's home state at Central Michigan and be part of the, uh, that program and become the athletic director and be back where my mom and dad were, her mother was there and our, our children could grow up with their grandparents a little bit. That was really important to who we were as a family um, we made a commitment. If one of our sons entered high school, we were not going to leave. We were going to see that high school experience through. And so probably there's times there that maybe something could have happened, but we were really committed to that. And so I ended up staying when all three of them went through high school yeah. at, in, uh, at Mount Pleasant. And uh, it was a really good thing for our family. And uh, I love that university. It was a terrific, um, terrific run. And um, again, I was close to it. I know so many people there. I have family who attended there and competed there. So uh, my two sons went to, all three of my sons graduated okay. from there. My two sons competed in uh, Division One baseball there. Uh, so it, it was is a really special place. But then the opportunity to come back west. I love the west, all our time in the Pac-12, Pac-10, now Pac-12, right. um, uh, to come back to Arizona. So, so you've between your time in Oregon and now your, your time as AD in Arizona, you've been in the league almost 25 years. Yes. So you've yes. seen a lot of evolution yes. of the conference. Uh, obviously a new commissioner, still relatively new commissioner. Mm -hmm. I was telling you that as someone who's grown up in the Southeast traditionally, I know that there are fantastic athletic programs in the, the West and sometimes they don't maybe get their due as much from a media exposure mm -hmm. standpoint. But I'm, I'm curious, your view of the evolution of the league, uh, Georgia's leadership, and how you go about making sure that you guys get the exposure that you need and deserve as a conference. Well, I think George is the perfect leader. Uh, our new commissioner, George Kliakoff, um, you know, a big thinker, uh, really dynamic, wanting to move things forward. And uh, I'm, I'm very bullish on his leadership and what he can do for the Pac-12 conference going forward. We do have a remarkable conference. And sometimes geographically, time zone wise, you get you know, you get a little bit sheltered. People don't hear as much or see as much about the, the league. Um, tremendous world-class institutions academically, athletic power, uh, athletic departments that are really powerful, and tremendous programs, um, and very broad-based. You know, a real long-standing commitment to broad-based, yeah. strong programs across the board. You know, not just locking in on some premier sports and being good, but really making a commitment across the board. And that's been a long-standing. And then again, the academic side is, is critical in the Pac-12. And uh, so you combine all those things, it is a fantastic league. And, um, but there's no question we need to position ourselves going forward with our new media package, uh, new media rights package, the ability to promote and put our program in places that are so important in this day and age because that exposure drives that attention, drives a lot of things, certainly drives revenue to the institutions and to the league. And, and that will be the key you know, thing over the next two and a half years of getting positioned properly to take that next leap. And again, I'm uh, very fortunate. I think our conference, we have outstanding presidents who are committed to moving that forward. And, uh, and then through George's leadership, we're gonna be in a very good place. Mm. I did a recent interview with Jamie Pollard, and he was referencing the Carnegie Foundation study from 1929 that said <laughs> there was a yeah. conversation about needed government involvement in college athletics, that student athletes weren't really students, and that coaches were paid too much, yeah. 1929. Yeah. So almost 100 years later, here we are, yeah. and there's some common themes, right, among others. And it's easy for those of us who have been around for a long time to step back and say, man, there's a lot in this gumbo right now, yeah. right? transfer portal, social justice issues, Alston, NIL, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I think that tough times or, um, or where there, there's a lot happening, you know, calls for extraordinary leadership. 
uh, you're someone who's been around long enough that you're one of those guys that has to exercise extraordinary leadership. How are you choosing to lead during these crazy times? Well, um, it, it is a different time in our industry, but you know, you, we think back, there's, there's been moments where we, we've, we've thought we could never get to that next hurdle. This was gonna be the real difficult challenge for college athletics, um, and, and, and we found our way through. You know, there's rocks and there's bumps and there's hiccups, but we, we generally find a way to come together as, as a collective body to, to move the, the industry, the enterprise forward. Um, but I do think it's very uncertain times right now, and it's probably more difficult than it's ever been for staff and for, um, you know, for the people who are around our programs daily. And it's, it's just important, I believe, to be, uh, to be you know, really uh, sharing a lot of information, a lot of communication to your teams, to your staff, to the people working for you and with you. And we've got a great team, and uh, um, you know, I, I think you've got to be vulnerable, too, at this time. We don't all have the answers. We yeah. don't know what's really going to happen. Um, I've been very open. I'm a strong believer in the college sports model, the collegiate sports model. Um, it's the only place in the world that it occurs, where we, where we mesh this great athletic experience with this tremendous academic experience, growing up as young people. It's, it's powerful. I was a student athlete. Again, I've seen my sons be student athletes. I'm very passionate about that. I understand it's going to move and change and grow, and we're going to be able to provide more for student athletes but let's not let's not forget the core of that so i i try to explain that i, I do i don't try I try to you know really share all the time how important that is to me and to our program because i don't want us to lose the bones the roots the guts of what's good about it but we've got to be open to change we have to be open and uh, and and back to it again lots of communication be a little bit vulnerable we don't know where we're going to go let's let's rally together and try to find a way to get to the right spot um, and i think in this times of uncertainty and then when we've gone through the pandemic and you know people i think kind of wake up every day going what next or how yeah. can you know um we need to hold that group together because i think the the next chapter can be very good it will be different um but it will be very good for college athletics if we can all come together as we've done in the past as a as a group as colleagues um as people that care deeply about student athletes um if it goes in a different direction, then, then maybe we need to you know, refocus. You know, maybe there are some different options yeah. for student, for athletes in the future, but I think there's something powerful about the student athlete experience. So. so we just wrapped up a great college World Series where Ole Miss won the national championship, competitive baseball season. A team, by the way, that didn't know on, on decision day if they were getting in the tournament. How about that? Right? Yeah. Um, you played baseball, your sons played baseball. Any strong feelings about the, the state of the game of baseball and whether or not the, the way scholarships are structured in baseball needs to continue to be revised or looked at? Interested in your thoughts? Yeah, I'm uh, very proud of the game of college baseball. I've had the opportunity to sit on the committee um, twice, chair the baseball committee, um, been involved in the transition from Rosenblatt to the, to the new stadium yeah. downtown in Omaha. So I think the game has grown so much. And now you see so many college players on major league rosters. You know, it's a great training ground. So I think the game has never been healthier. Um, I do believe we've got to take a look at how we support um, many of our sports. I wouldn't just single out baseball, but uh, certainly baseball and uh, the need for, you know, an, an opportunity for, for more scholarship dollars to be, um, you know, lodged there. there. It's been a, we've done so many different things to the game and, and imp again, improved it from the student athlete side too. Uh, we've worked very hard in, in college baseball with Major League Baseball to get the draft kind of in the right spot to really connect a lot of loose ends that were probably fraying the game early, but now have brought it together. So, uh, again, being a strong advocate, I'd, I'd look for more ways, for more opportunities, and more scholarship growth in the game of baseball. I think it'd be good for the game, um, and, uh, and I think there's opportunity out there to do that. Mm -hmm. All right, so last question, Transformation Committee. A lot of work going on. There's a lot of conversation here. Uh, this week at NACTA about, about the Transformation Committee. A lot of conferences are meeting independently about it. Mm -hmm. you, you and your peers, I'm sure, are talking about it. Um, what do you look to as being the most viable outcomes of that? Um, I'm not necessarily saying specificity here, but what do you think has to come out of this on the other side to make sure that this model continues into the long run? And where does Arizona fit in all that? 
Yeah, I think, look, uh, it's so uncertain. I think we need some clarity. We need some some points, some beacons to be set out there that we can follow and, and move towards. I think right now we're just sailing or, or, or swimming very fast through the night, trying to get our keep moving forward, but we don't really know where we're going to end up. And I, that's problematic in, in my mind. You know, that's where you see a rush to do a lot of different things, whether that's in name, image, and likeness, or worries about funding, or how we can talk about more scholarships. I think we've got to decide, you know, what are our beacons and where are we going as an industry? And I hope that the, the, the committee can begin to start to place some of those out there. And then we as, a, so, as the uh, different divisions can work together to really begin to chart that course. Okay, mm -hmm. how are we gonna get there? What are the most important considerations for us? I do think we need some guardrails. I, I, I don't think just pulling everything back and unlimited on everything is good for, the, for college sports and good for, you know, uh, for the enterprise. It's gonna be very difficult to sustain it in that way. We need guardrails. We need control points. We need some maximum and minimums. Um, otherwise, I think it becomes very problematic. But I do think there's going to be a separation and a, and a growth curve that people are going to have to determine uh, which area of that growth curve am I going to live. I don't think that's a bad thing. I think it allows us to begin to then make good conscious decisions that fit our programs the right, right. way. Um, and it's, it, that's challenging. Uh, you know, been at the, uh, at the Central Michigan in the Mid-American Conference, um, modest budgets, uh, very competitive programs, um, value the experience for their student athletes, but do it in a little bit different way. Same number of student athletes at Central Michigan as we have at, at Arizona, um, but yet about 80 to 90 million dollars difference yeah. in budget, in dollars yeah. that you can, you know, um, allocate to your student athletes and their experiences and your coaches and the things that you can do. So um, that probably is what really strains the overall group. And then, so again, how can we place people in that curve, find the right spots, be very proud, that's, that's what's gonna happen and, and work towards it. And then again, we can make really good decisions for our programs. We wanna be a high level, high performing program. Yeah. That's what our, our people expect. That's where we wanna be. That's where we traditionally have been. Uh, so we'll continue to look for that as we go forward and being a part of that, um, that, that high end of the end of the curve that we want to be on. That's awesome. Very insightful interview. It's moved very quickly. I really appreciate you spending some time with us. Thanks, Mike. I appreciate having me. Same here. All right, folks. He's Dave Hickey, the athletic director at the University of Arizona, and I'm Mike Hamilton, your host for From the Chair. Listen to us wherever you listen to your podcast on audio every Wednesday and on YouTube if you want to see the video. Goodbye now from Las, Las Vegas. See you next week.